name is Christoph Paulse, and I'm a senior researcher at the Asser Institute in The Hague. And I would like to welcome you to this online supranational criminal law or SEL lecture. The SEL lecture series is a series on international criminal law and has been organized since 2003 by the Asser Institute in cooperation with the Coalition for the ICC and the Gotje Center of International Legal Studies of Leiden University. And tonight's webinar is moreover co-organized by the International Humanitarian and Criminal Law Platform, which is an interfaculty research platform on international humanitarian law and international criminal law, in which various Dutch and Belgian organizations and universities participate. Tonight's webinar is entitled The SDL Judgment in the Ayash case et al. Sorry, Ayash et al. case, Justice for Lebanon. And as you all know, on the 18th of August of this year, the trial chamber of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the STL, issued its long-awaited verdict in the case of Ayash et al. And the trial chamber found one defendant, Salim Jamil Ayash, guilty beyond reasonable doubt for his role in perpetrating a 2005 explosion in Lebanon, which killed 22 people, including former Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. The three other defendants were acquitted of all charges. The judgment also concluded that, and I quote, Syria and Hezbollah may have had motives to eliminate Mr. Hariri and some of his political allies, but that there is no evidence that the Hezbollah leadership had any involvement in Mr. Hariri's murder and no direct evidence of Syrian involvement in it. On the one hand, the responses to the judgment have been critical and with commentators wondering whether the length and costs of the trial justify this outcome. On the other, the complexity of conducting these kinds of prosecutions was highlighted, as well as the fact that the judgment offers an independent and detailed account of what really happened some 15 years ago. Now, tonight's panel will discuss the Ayash judgment and its potential for achieving justice in Lebanon in more detail. And I'm very honored to now introduce our esteemed panelists to you. The first panelist is Ms. Olga Kavran. She is head of outreach and legacy at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and has been living and working in Beirut since 2010. And prior to that, she has worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, first in outreach, and then as the spokesperson for the prosecutor under both Carla Del Ponte and Sergei Bramatz. Olga holds an LM in public international law from Lady University. And for the past three years, she has been teaching public international law at the American University in Beirut. And Olga has also published a number of articles and book chapters on the topic of international criminal courts and the right to information, and is currently working on a PhD on the topic at the Vrije Universiteit in Brussels. And she's originally for, from the former Yugoslavia. The second panelist is Dr. Thijs Bauknecht. He's a researcher at the NIOT, which is the Amsterdam-based Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. And before that, from 2004 to 2012, Thijs was a researcher at the ICTR and ICC, also trial monitor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the SCSL, and journalist for Radio Netherlands Worldwide, an international justice tribune. Altogether, he covered proceedings against uh, 130 suspects of atrocity crimes committed across the globe. Thijs studied non-Western history, international law, and genocide studies and his current research focuses on universal jurisdiction and on transitional justice for colonial violence. And Thijs' book, Transitional History, Examining the Legacies of the ICTR, SESL, and ICC, is coming out next year. And finally, Dr. Ilaria Zavoli. She's a lecturer in law at the School of Law at the University of Leeds in the UK and a qualified lawyer in Italy. And Ilaria holds a law degree, cum laude, and a postgraduate specialization diploma in law, also cum laude, from the University of Bologna. She also holds an advanced master in public international law with a specialization in international criminal law from Leiden University in the Netherlands. And Ilaria has completed a PhD in international criminal law at the University of Leeds. And a research product, uh, project has focused on in absentia proceedings in international criminal justice, very relevant, of course, for tonight's lecture, considering their foundations, operation, and future perspectives. And Ilaria's research interests lie in the areas of international criminal law, international law, and criminal law. I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for being with us. And as agreed, and for ease also of communication, we will first we will use first names during this webinar. And about the structure of this event, I will pose a number of questions to the panelists. And after that, we will have some time for uh, uh, a Q&A with you and the people watching at home. 
So please send in your questions via the chat function, which you will be able to find in the bar below. And also please specify to whom you are directing the question. Now, I can imagine that many of our viewers have tuned in to this webinar to find out more about the judgment, of course, especially when they saw its number of pages, 2,682. And this is including the annexes and a table of contents of 40 pages. So Olga, I know it's a rather impossible task, but could you explain to us in let's say some 10 to 12 minutes, the context in which this judgment was issued as well as its main findings? Thank you. Sure, I'm also gonna share um, my screen just so that you can see a couple of highlights that I just wanted to um, point to. Um, first of all, let me, um, express my sincere thanks for inviting me to participate in this event. It's really an honor to discuss this important topic with yourself and with Thais and Ilaria, and I'm really looking forward to the questions from our audience as well. Um, I need to stress at the outset that I'm not speaking on behalf of the SKL judges or the institution as such, and that any summary I provide here will not do justice to the remarkable results of the painstaking work of my colleagues. The investigation began in 2005, the indictment was issued in 2011, and the trial began in 2014. During 415 days in court, the judges heard from 297 witnesses and received 171,000 pages of exhibits. 74 victims participated in the trial through their legal representatives. As you mentioned, the judgment is very long, but for the first time in international courts, the judges also issued an authoritative summary of 149 pages, which is um, with the intent, of course, of making it much more accessible for a larger segment of the interested um, communities. But let us begin by looking at what actually happened. So on Monday, uh, Valentine's Day, 14th of February, 2005, just before 1 p.m., a massive explosion, the aftermath of which you see on the screen, shook Beirut. It killed 22 people, including the former Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, who was its main target, and injured 226 others. Similar to what we experienced in this year's destructive blast in August, witnesses spoke of hearing a huge roaring sound, the sound of an aircraft going through the sound barrier, and are feeling a wave of hot pressure and an earthquake. The explosion was heard throughout the city up to 25 kilometers away. The judges found that the blast was caused by explosives equivalent of two and a half to 3,000 kilograms of TNT. They, they found the device was detonated approximately 50 to 80 centimeters above ground level in a street lined by multi-story buildings. This created a deliberate canyon effect that increased its destructive power. Shortly after the explosion on the afternoon of 14th of February, the Al Jazeera news network in Beirut received calls claiming responsibility for the attack and the videotape that it later broadcast. In the video, a young Palestinian man by the name of Mr. Ahmad Abu Adas claimed to have executed a, quote, resounding martyrdom operation, end quote, against Mr. Hariri on behalf of, as it later turned out, a non-existent fundamentalist group. Though Mr. Abu Adas has not been seen since mid-January 2005, no remains recovered from the crime scene match his DNA profile. The trial chamber was satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the claim of responsibility for the attack as shown in the video was a false claim and that Mr. Abu Adas was not the suicide bomber. Incidentally, human remains, to be precise, 92 pieces amounting to less than one kilogram in total of one individual who has not yet been identified were found at the crime scene. The judges could only establish that these remains belonged to a male under the, under the age of 25 and that he had most likely been the suicide bomber. The judges found that the explosion was a terrorist act within the meaning of Article 314 of the Lebanese Criminal Code, which is applied by the STL, and which defines a terrorist act as one intended to cause a state of terror 
and committed by means liable to create a public danger, such as explosive devices, for example. The judges found that the attack was intended to resonate throughout Lebanon and in the region, and its intended effects were not just confined to Mr. Hariri's supporters. Rather, the evidence of the political background to the attack demonstrated that it was designed to destabilize Lebanon generally. As mentioned by Christophe, the trial chamber unanimously found Mr. Salim Jamil Ayash guilty beyond reasonable doubt as a co-perpetrator of conspiracy aimed at committing a, terror, committing a terrorist act, committing a terrorist act by means of an explosive device, intentional homicide of Mr. Rafiq Hariri with premeditation by using explosive materials, intentional homicide of an additional 21 persons with premeditation by using explosive materials and attempted intentional homicide of 226 persons with premeditation by using explosive materials. The remaining accused were found not guilty. The judges will pronounce the sentence on the 11th of December next week, following which both parties can appeal. By the time of his death, Mr. Hariri had served five terms as the Prime Minister of Lebanon. He was a successful businessman and prominent public figure whom the media often referred to as Mr. Lebanon. He had very sophisticated security arrangements in place, both private and those provided by the Lebanese internal security forces. Mr. Hariri usually traveled in a six vehicle convoy which included signal jamming devices designed to disrupt signals of remotely controlled improvised explosive devices or IEDs, as well as, a, as well as a Chevrolet suburban vehicle equipped and manned as an ambulance. In the judgment, the, the STL judges found that to assassinate someone as closely guarded and protected as Mr. Hariri required much careful planning and preparation. And this included, and I quote, obtaining a detailed knowledge of his movements, his convoy, its personnel, and his usual position within it. Establishing closed mobile networks for communications between those having some role in the plot, knowing or otherwise. Choosing a method of assassination. Obtaining the Mitsubishi Cantor, the vehicle used for the assassination. Picking a suitable site for an explosion selecting a manner of detonation, including recruiting the suicide bomber, procuring the explosives, and setting up the claim of responsibility, including arranging Mr. Abu Adas's role in it." End quote. And they established that exactly such planning and preparation took place. The case was incredibly complex. The judges stated that, and again I quote, of central importance to the case is telecommunications evidence comprising cell site evidence, call data records, and call sequence tables, end quote. Such evidence was never actually used before in a criminal trial of this scale, actually, uh, either nationally or internationally. Investigators collected and closely examined the circumstances of the use of mobile phones in an attempt to find their users. The raw data Called, called sequence tables, which you can see on the screen, is data that your mobile telephone service provider collects in order to, ensure, to issue you with a bill for, your services at, for their services at the end of the month. So basically, this is just collected as part of normal business practices. It contains information such as the date and time of call, the telephone numbers involved, the specific identification number of the handsets in use, and the cell towers which were activated through the call or the text message. To make this information intelligible, the prosecution organized it into call sequence tables, which lists this information as you can see on your screen now. The investigators also conducted cell site analysis to track a phone's movements over time based on the cell site the phone connects to during a call, which you can see on the screen now. 
The cell site analysis was also used to determine whether two or more, more mobile phones co-locate. That is, whether the mobile phones used cell sites in the same area at approximately the same time or travel the same route over the same time period, which would allow them to conclude that the users of the mobiles were together or that one person was using several phones. Why was this necessary? All of this was happening in 2004 and 2005 before smartphones and when it had still been possible to buy prepaid mobile phones without proper identification, which is much harder to do today, of course. So in order to establish the identity of the users, the investigators had to apply these different techniques of following a phone's movement to identify a timeline of use and to identify contacts between different telephones. The investigators examined millions of call records and text messages to find evidence of communications between mobiles from which patterns could be found. On receiving the evidence, the judges had to conduct their own analysis of the data of thousands of calls presented to them to verify whether alleged patterns indeed emerged. And they concluded that in fact, four different interconnected, coordinated and covert mobile phone network networks had been used to plan and execute the assassination of Rafiq Hariri. Ayash was the user of a phone in each of the networks. One of the networks included the late Mustafa Badreddin, who had been indicted and tried in absentia along with the other four, but was reported killed in Syria in 2016. The judges also established that Mr. Badreddin was a senior Hezbollah military official and that Ayash, Onaisi, and Sabra were Hezbollah supporters. The judges found that the attack did not occur in a political or historical vacuum and that Syria and Hezbollah may have had motives to eliminate Mr. Hariri and some of his political allies. Significantly, they established many important facts about the period often referred to as Pax Syriana, the period following the end of the Lebanese civil war. During this time, Syria had an overwhelming political, military, and economic dominance in Lebanon. They controlled the country. As an example, in August 2004, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad wanted a supporter of Syria, Emil Lahoud, to remain Lebanese president beyond the limit to his term in office imposed by the Lebanese constitution. President Bashar ordered the then Prime Minister Hariri to support the change in the constitution and consequently the extension of Lahoud's mandate. He stated that Syria alone would choose the president of Lebanon. Hariri attempted to oppose this, but ultimately obliged, and Lahoud's mandate was extended. Soon after, Hariri resigned and gradually moved closer to the opposition group, which had coalesced by that time. Hariri's political allies supported the UN Security Council Resolution 1559, passed in September 2004, which had called for the withdrawal of Syrian troops from Lebanon and disbanding of Hezbollah and they publicly called for an end to the Syrian political, military, and economic dominance over the country. The assassination attempt against Hariri's ally, Marwan Hamede, on the 1st of October 2004, which is the subject of the tribunal's next case, incidentally also against the convicted Mr. Ayash, was seen as a warning to Mr. Hariri and others not to cross the line. Hariri resigned on the 20th of October 2004 and was planning to run in the May 2005 elections proposing the loosening of Syrian dominance over Lebanon. A proposed electoral law supported by Syria was designed to diminish Hariri's chances to become prime minister again. Despite Hariri's opposition, the Syrian government insisted that he accept so-called Syrian deposits, pro-Syrian individuals, in his electoral list, list. Another interesting section in which the judges describe the context is the one about Rustam Khazale, the then chief of Syrian military intelligence in Lebanon. Since 1993, in Rafiq Hariri's first term in office, Mr. Khazale had demanded and received regular monthly cash payments in the tens of thousands of dollars from Hariri through intermediaries. 
On Sunday, 13th of February, 2005, the day before the assassination, Hazala demanded a double payment for the first time. The trial chambers established that Hazala, and I quote, had a reason to demand a double payment on the day before Mr. Hariri's death, meaning that he had grounds to believe that there would be no more payments from that date onwards, end quote. In conclusion, though he's the only individual convicted, Samil Jamil Ayash did not act alone. At least 10 and possibly many more individuals used four different interconnected, coordinated, and covert mobile phone networks. The judges determined that the attack on Mr. Hariri was carefully planned and implemented. The perpetrators even created a false claim of responsibility featuring a young man acting on behalf of a fictional group who has disappeared, but who was not the suicide bomber. In my view, the fact that we know anything about how this crime was planned and committed is remarkable, and a tribute to the hard work of the many Lebanese and international investigators, one of whom was the Lebanese investigator Wissam Eid, who was himself assassinated in 2008. Finally, I will close with what I consider a very important message from the judges as well. They stress that they're not a truth and reconciliation commission and could only pronounce on whether the prosecutor has proven beyond a reasonable doubt the charges against the accused listed in the indictment. As Thais taught me in a conference several years ago, while judges in criminal cases are bound by very, the very high threshold of beyond reasonable doubt, Historians, journalists, researchers, and others are not. They can take the many important facts the judges did establish beyond reasonable doubt and fill in the blanks using additional information that may not have made it into the court record. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will finish and I, and I sincerely apologize for going and running over time, but it's really difficult to summarize this huge document in, in, in such a short space. Thank you, Olga. No, I think you did a remarkable job. Thank you so much for that very interesting and useful presentation. Um, let's maybe move to Ilaria. So what are your main observations from this judgment and this trial more generally? Also taking in, into account, of course, the fact that the suspects were tried in absentia, which is the topic of your PhD. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. It's a pleasure to talk about a topic that has really um, covered like the last six to seven um, years of my research, in particular with my PhD, but also the dissertation yeah, of my, sorry. Sorry, can you, can you hear me? All right. Okay, so yeah, I was saying that this uh, is something that really like um, occupied my time for the last six to seven years. So it's, it's really difficult for me really just to like, condense everything in like a couple of minutes. I would try my best. Um, so I, I would say that, um, yes, the, the judgment and the trial itself was highly complicated and highly complex. And on top of what Olga said so far, in terms of the factual findings and legal findings of the tribunal, there was the additional very complex problem from a procedural point of view, but also substantially criminal point of view of the use of trials in absentia. As probably many in the audience know, um, trials in absentia are uh, in modern international criminal justice just used at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And this is something that uh, tells us also of the lack really of guidelines and principles that we cannot really find from other international criminal tribunals in terms of how this type of very special procedures can be used in practice. Because one thing is how they are um, written down on a piece of paper, theoretically speaking, and then how they are actually applied into practice. And something that was difficult, I think, in this tribunal was really to see it um, in, like, in uh, applying into practice trials in absentia in a way that was fair and it was also in line with international human rights law standards and international criminal law standards. So throughout my research, I have been interviewing practitioners that have been working at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and not only, also at other tribunals. And uh, what I really gathered was the idea that it, it is a type of procedure that is difficult for all parties, not just for the defense, 
but for all parties. And I think that this comes clear when you look at the decision in this judgment, where there is indeed a sense of a lack of information that is affecting all parties, not just the defense counsel that didn't have any contact with the absent accused. And so they couldn't get any information and any instructions from their clients as to their for instance, procedural strategy, but also for the OTP, because the prosecutor was just mainly relying upon circumstantial evidence, as it is said many, many, like in many different parts of the judgments by the judges themselves. So it becomes really difficult to start looking at um, international criminal proceedings in like in a common way, in a traditional way, when we have trials in absentia that have their own features and they are an additional complex issue and challenge for the tribunal itself that is on top of everything else, given already the social and political highly complex situation that was and that is in Lebanon. So this is my first take. And the second take is about some specific additional things that have happened in the course throughout these years, in the course of the proceeding and the trial. That is, first of all, obviously in 2012, the decision to hold the trials in absentia. This was, and this is part obviously of the rules of the tribunal. So an article 22 of the Special Tribunal of Lebanon Statute says that this is a possibility. So it was triggered at that time, but it was already highly debated and highly criticized. Then a second important step and a second challenge that came out during the work of the tribunal was the death or alleged death of Mr. Badruddin, because this is an additional problem that in a common proceeding might have been solved differently and might not have not been so problematic. But in a trial in abstention where already all the accused are absent, the death of one of them might complicate things even further because we are not even sure whether this is actually really happened. And that's why Olga correctly was also saying it's allegedly dead. So this is what the result and the ultimate conclusion was of the tribunal. But we have no like ultimate um, evidence of that. And then finally, the question of retrial. So, so far, we don't have this problem, not yet, because we don't have any accuser that shows up and has asked for a retrial. But this is a possibility that is among the rules and the norms of the status of the tribunal. And so the other problem that this tribunal might face in the future is, what about the possibility for an accused that decides to show up and always is arrested or surrenders and then asks for a trial? What is then the um, reason of having like a trial in absentia in the first place if any accused that shows up later can ask for a retrial. So basically we start again. So all these years that have passed and the amount of money has been spent on this tribunal uh, then might be perceived as being wasted because we need to start again. And also there are gaps in the statute about the retrial because it's not really detailed. So there is still like a lack of information about who's gonna do this retrial, especially because this tribunal is temporary. So it's not like the ICC that is a permanent court. So the additional problems come from, from a legal perspective comes in when we discuss the technicalities of the procedure. So who's going to decide this possible retrial? Is it at national level, at international level? And then what happens, for instance, to the reparations? Because we all know that the Special Tribunal for Lemon cannot grant reparations, but the conviction, for instance, Misha, yes, could be used by the victims to ask for reparations at national level. So the question is, what happens with a retrial? Will this reparation be quashed? And so we go back to like to zero to, from scratch. And what about then the victims? What are the expectations there? Are they met still? Or is this just something that is not um, done? So the victims might be even more dissatisfied with the outcome of the judgment. So it's highly complex. I don't know. I, I don't really have a strong opinion on the judgment one way or the other. I'm just seeing it from a researching point of view that I spent some years on it and I can really see it developing and additional issues coming in at various points of the proceeding. Thank you very much, Hilaria. Olga, would you like to respond before we move to, let's say the implications for justice in Lebanon more generally and to Thais? No, I think we can continue uh, and then maybe have a discussion yeah. afterwards and answer questions after? 
That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, so now that we have addressed the judgment uh, in more detail, let us zoom in on the implications it may have for achieving justice in Lebanon. Um, Thais, you have been monitoring judgments of international and hybrid tribunals for many years, and you're an expert in transitional justice as well. So from a broader perspective, to what extent can judgments from international and hybrid tribunals assist countries in moving away from this culture of impunity to a culture of accountability? And what do you think will be the effect of this particular judgment on Lebanese society. Thank you very much, uh, Crystal, for your very generous invitation and also for your introduction. And of course, for the, for the thought-provoking questions. And um, let me start by saying that your questions address the future. And I'm speaking as a historian of mass violence and transitional justice. So it's a challenging question, but I will try to draw some lessons from, from the past. Um, and as you said, in the past 17 years or so, I've been, um, monitoring many trials and I've seen many judgments being being rendered. And I think from the outset, it's perhaps good to say that um, every time there, there's a trial and a judgment is that there is before there's a situation where there's an anticipation that these judgments have broader political and social consequences, much broader than simply rendering judicial opinions and meeting out uh, punishments. So I think in reality, we should not be too overly excited about what the project of international criminal justice can realistically achieve beyond this. And in that sense, we also have to perceive the special tribunal for Lebanon. And of course, I've been following it quite closely, particularly in the beginning. And I must say that in the beginning, it was really a sensation. I mean, this was going to be the first terrorism tribunal. And actually, on the first day that it opened, I was there in March 2009. We can already see that everybody was ready for it. It was still in a very smelly gym, but there was still an actual punch bowl hanging in the ceiling. So I think the expectations were rather high. And like many others, of course, I also had a lot of expectations about this new tribunal on the block. However, after a while, I also did not expect this unique judicial experience to come to a judgment. So in any case, it took a bit, quite a while for, for the trial to materialize and also for a judgment to come out. And Many journalists um, in the process, sadly, I must say, also stopped following it very closely. Also in these terms, quite interestingly, uh, the first trial actually on the STL's premises were about terrorism, but actually were about somebody else. This was Liberian President Charles Taylor, who was also prosecuted for, for crimes of terrorism. And I think in terms of your question, it's already quite telling that his single judgment in that particular case actually hardly had any effect on supporting further accountability in Liberia. As for the STL process itself, um, which of course was a trial without human suspects in the dock, I think it was interesting for many levels. First of all, I think it was controversial, but also it was theoretical. So there were many questions. Was there any judgment coming out of this process? Was it going to be fair? Was it going to be credible? And was it going to be perceived as, uh, as being legitimate? And of course, these were very tough questions. And I think, as Hilaria also said, that these questions still linger, linger on until this day. So now turning to your precise questions on impact and effect. What do judgments do after they're pronounced and published on the website? Do they end up in the archive or do people actually do something for it? I think we still do not know yet so much about how this is going to play out in Lebanon. I mean, the judgment was rendered in August, so it's still quite fresh in our memory. Mostly, however, if you look at other tribunals, judgments are quite soon forgotten as well, particularly after the initial flurry in, in media coverage. So generally quickly thereafter, also as tribunals hardly provide any aftercare, judgments also start leading their own lives. So people might like them, they might dislike them, they find them useful, they find them useless, they must agree, or perhaps they don't, uh, they can disagree. So the impact, if knowable at all, must therefore at least be versatile, but I think the effects are still to play out. And I think this is only, and I think um, Olga also um, touched upon this subject, is that this can only be the case if a judgment is widely read and understood. And it has been said already, the document is massive. It's 2,640 pages long and so far available in English. And of course, there's an authoritative Arabic uh, summary of the judgment as well. However, and I've calculated it, if you read 30 pages an hour, that's nearly two and a half weeks of full-time reading to sort of grasp 
at least at least read the judgment. And then, of course, there is the issue of style. Legal judgments, and of course, including this one, have a very particular style of writing. So there's no prose. It's very technical, as, as Olga has shown as well. And it's also very legal. And for these reasons, it can also be perceived to be quite boring, but also very complex and perhaps also very narrowly focused because it's, a, it's about a one-time event. So actually, they're not written for popular consumption. I think this is, this is an important thing to, to think about. And as Olga rightfully said, the judges also acknowledged that they were not a truth commission. So their purpose perhaps was, was very different. So as a result, I think, yes, there was quite some history in the judgments, but the judgment of course is very, very different still from popular historical writing. So of course there's a lot of facts and findings about the things that happened, but for judgments to be read by the public and to have any societal effects, they must also be accessible. And I think, and it's also important, is that the topic must also be immediate. And perhaps this is not uh, the case in this particular instance. So if we read the judgment, we see that there's a narration about a single event that took place 14, 15 years ago. And it's about the role, if any, of five people who were accused by a prosecutor of having executed. So by, by now, actually, we have a judgment which is about a cold case. So not everybody would still feel, perhaps any longer, a connection to this world historical event. Some people may actually perceive it to be a footnote in history. Other matters, as we know, <laughs> of course, have also perhaps become more present. Um, we had the attack, uh, sorry, we had this, this huge disaster. And of course, we're living in a global pandemic um, as well at the moment. So I think, and this is quite important, is that the judgment is about a handful of people who are as well at face value also historically insignificant. They were not or were very little known before the attack. And after the attack, we only got to know their names. So still, it's hard to put a picture to who was involved in the crime. So in that sense, the tribunal has been chasing ghosts. And what we know about them is that uh, we have some imaginary culprits. Another important matter, I think, is about the question to what extent a single criminal trial, one that concerns political violence, is also about addressing the root causes of that political violence and formulating perhaps structural solutions to a problem that's not a legal problem at all. And as Mahmoud Mandani recently um, in his new book eloquently explained is basically, I'm summarizing here, he says, individual criminal judgments are not meant to do this. And I think this is important to bear in mind. This of course is not to say that there's no impact at all. So I think on the macro level, the trial and the judgments are very likely to have affected the survivors of the attack, as well as relatives, friends, and acquaintances of those who were killed or were, who were injured. So in one way or another, the effect is that, that each of these individuals have their own opinions, emotions about the judgments. These, of course, are very intimate and also very private. So they're also very difficult to know and to make a general assessment about what it would actually mean for the victims. On the meso level, so beyond the affected communities, I think the effect of the judgment is less clear. And perhaps, at least forensically, and I think Olga again really uh, spelled this out quite well, is that the judgment quite meticulously details what happened and may have provided some additional answers to questions that were previously unclear. So at least it fills some gaps in, in what we know and what we didn't know. Having said that, overall, for a judgment to have significant impact, it must also contain exciting answers. And I think this is a very important uh, issue. And in this regard, the impact is likely to be limited. So reading the document, we still have no answer to the million dollar question of who or who masterminded and who ordered the attack and for what reasons. So at best, the effect is that people will continue to speculate about this secret conspiracy, which in effect, which of course is an effect in itself. So turning to the second part of the question and then I'm going to wrap up as well about impunity. I think this is a very hard question to address in a scholarly way. I mean, not only does it require us to speculate about something that is still about to happen, but it also very, uh, depends very much, perhaps too much, on how political actors define criminality, impunity, and justice. So we have to think about those concepts as well. Also, we, may, we must consider sequence in this context. And I think in this case, and this may actually be very well the crux of the question, is that Lebanon itself took the initiative in requesting the international investigation. 
and also took part in the establishment and the maintenance of the tribunal. So one could say actually that the shift towards a culture of accountability for political violence actually originated from Lebanon itself and not so much from the outset. And as long as the bills are paid, the, commission, the, the commitment may actually still be there. So empirically, I think there was some level of uh, accountability. We had a trial, we had a judgment on our desk now, but the elephant in the room remains that there is still no available tangible person or entity to actually receive the punishment that will be meted out next week. So we must conceptualize as well, what kind of accountability this is. The next question then of course is, does this one judgment also lead to more trials, to more judgments um, beyond the special tribunal for Lebanon? And will they be similar or different? I think we don't know yet. So this brings us to the thorny issue of impunity and then I'm going to finish. I think we can understand impunity as the absence of atonement for wrongdoing. And in this particular instance, there at least was a dent in impunity. Whether this will lead to a broader move away from a culture of impunity, of course, is a question that's very much contingent on current and future political actors, realities and considerations. And looking around the globe, and perhaps I'm, I'm ending on a quite pessimistic note, I actually discern a movement amongst political leaderships to cozy up in impunity and not to get rid of it. Um, so I will leave it there for, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Thais. Yeah, thanks really for providing that broader uh, perspective. Um, before we go to the Q&A with the audience, Ilaria and Olga, would you like to respond to Thais or to anything that you've heard uh, so far? Yeah, sure. So uh, just generally speaking, in terms of trials in absentia, I think it's a very, very interesting um, point and, uh, and in a way experiment and obviously I don't mean that in a, in a, in a negative uh, way. So what we have as you rightfully pointed out is the first time that this has been tried at the international level. It is obviously not something new to national systems around the world, at least some of them, a large segment of them, but it is new in the international level. And I think that it's, I think it's probably too early to say um, actually to make a final, final decision as to whether that was the right thing to do or not. Because you always have to look at, on the one hand, you've got the experience of the ICTY, right? Where in some instances, for, you know, for as long as 16 years, all you had in the public domain was the indictment, right? There was that Rule 61 hearing in the ICTY, which some people construe as something more than that, but it really isn't. It's still based only on prosecution evidence, right? So that's what you had, for example, in the case of Mladic for 16 years. So proponents of holding a trial in absentia will say, at least now we have had evidence that was duly tested in court. And I think most commentators, and I listened to the defense counsel as well, who spoke about this issue, they don't dispute that the trial was conducted in um, accordance with the highest standards. At least I have not seen or heard any comment to the contrary in terms of the way that the, the trial was actually conducted. So I think that the final decision on whether it was you know, good to proceed with trials in absentia or to maybe reach this day still waiting for somebody to be arrested remains to be seen personally. I'd rather see the judgment that we have with all the facts that have been established than not. But again, I, I'm just expressing a very personal opinion right here. In terms of de um, what's important as well is the context. We're talking about a crime, as you rightfully pointed out, that was committed in 2005. We must not forget the situation in the world and in Lebanon at 2005, we cannot look at it through the prism of 2020 for a billion reasons. One is the situation in Lebanon, one is the situation in Syria, one is the situation in the world as the, as the pandemic and so forth. We simply cannot look at the importance of this and not least of which is the blast that happened in Beirut on the 4th of August, which don't forget occurred four days before the initial date set for the reading of the judgment, which out of a uh, pious uh, uh, respect for the victims was postponed for 10 days and then issued on the 18th of, of August. So again, all of this is uh, important context. Another element of context, in Lebanon, there is no authoritative book on Lebanese history, right? 
So the 120 pages that are in the full judgment about the political and historical background is probably the one authoritative text you have about a segment of that history, albeit looked at through the prism of a prosecution case. And we all know that that's obviously only, only always going to be a part of the story, right? But still, it's there. And it's there to be included in whatever narrative people uh, put together to tell about this part of their history. Very important for Lebanon. Um, another thing, in Lebanon, assassinations had almost become commonplace. And I'm sorry to say they did not entirely stop with the establishment of the tribunal or the, or the, or the case of the tribunal. So it's, it's something else to consider. It's, it's an unusual situation. I'm not aware of a country in which that is quite as commonplace as it seems to have been um, in, in Lebanon. Also, don't forget, we mentioned Syria. The war in Syria started for more or less at the same time or just before um, the indictment was issued. The whole situation in Lebanon changed dramatically in many respects because of the influx of refugees, because of all kinds of problems. Again, to make this seem like a footnote in history. But I ask you again to look back at March 2005. Look at what was occurring on the streets of Lebanon in March 2005, when millions of people, a couple of million people by some estimates, were in the streets demonstrating against the Syrian presence. And in fact, as a consequence of all of this, at the end of April 2005, Syria did leave Lebanon, at least formally, after 29 years. So it may seem like a footnote in history today, but I would argue that it was a very important, the assassination itself and the series of assassinations before and after it were not insignificant at all, particularly not at that time. And again, the world was invested in this. Don't forget, we had the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The Syrian role that was important in terms of allying or not allying with um, the US and others in this endeavor, what that meant in terms of their relationship with the West, how that turned, why that turned, why the resolution 1559. I mean, there's so much to take into consideration that is around this issue, right? That I think I, I always, you know, see it as, it's, it, again, 15 years later, yes, it might appear like a footnote in history, but it's, it really was important at the time. And I will, and I will also, uh, one other thing, if you permit me, um, about the case itself. So we have one case so far, right? If you remember the, the jurisprudence of the ICTY and the way that the cases of the ICTY unfold, um, in, the, in the beginning, the first cases were also only against low-level perpetrators. And this is for a reason. This is because that's the only evidence that the prosecution could collect at that stage. It was only later on when people started coming forward, people who were referred to as quote unquote insider witnesses, people from within the systems that were committing the crimes who were willing to testify. It's only after they started coming forward that it, was, that it became possible to go after those at higher levels of responsibility. We don't have that at the STM. We have, at, at the moment, we have this one case and we have another case coming up, which is against Mr. Ayash. And we, it remains to be seen whether there is any new evidence of, of different involvement. But again, he's the only person indicted, right? So that's something else to keep in mind. And, and, and again, um, I'm just saying, but my, my point, which I keep repeating is given the lengths to which the perpetrators of this crime went to conceal the crime, including kidnapping an individual who has not been heard from since. It's really remarkable that we know anything about it, not that we don't know everything about it. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, it for, for, for this. Thanks, uh, Olga. Ilaria, would you also like to respond? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we touch upon um, very important points here with Olga and Thais. Um, one that I think it's, it's really <laughs> fundamental when we talk about tries in absentia is to keep in mind what, is, what are the expectations that we have over not just a normal criminal proceeding, but a tries in absentia. 
Because first of all, if we think that a trial in absentia would be the same as the norm as a normal common proceeding, we are wrong. And it's a, a I think a false interpretation of what a trial in absentia would be. Um, not just because we have the physical absence of the accused, but because as I as I said before, there is a complexity of how the different parties then relate to each other, to the evidence and to the procedure itself without having the accused. It's, and, and, and some of the defense counsel told me like repeatedly that this is like having um, Hamlet without the prince. So without having the main character present and we are still talking about him or her. The other thing is, as Thais was saying about impunity. Yes, definitely. There is indeed a question about possible impunity and about also the satisfaction, perhaps not just from the victim side, but also generally speaking, the public in Lebanon with the result of the tribunal and the, the judgment. However, keep in mind this, that trials in absentia doesn't mean conviction. And generally speaking, no cr inter criminal proceedings and international criminal proceedings means conviction. There can be both acquittals or convictions. And it doesn't mean that because we're using a trial in absentia and we are conducting a trial in absentia, then we will end up for sure with a conviction. The standards are the same, so it's beyond reasonable doubt. And if that's not met, the judges cannot say then you are convicted, although it's a trial in absentia. So this is something that I think we, um, when, when there were criticism about trial in absentia, the fact that it didn't met it didn't sorry, meet the uh, you know, expectations in terms of conviction. It's just starting with the wrong assumption that the trials in absentia means a conviction. Um, the, other, the other problem is that, and, and I totally agree with Olga, the context is fundamental also. Trials in absentia probably, and, and this is my, again, my view as a researcher of these type of proceedings, do not really work well in all contexts. And I'm not just talking about the social and political context of reference, so where the crimes have been committed committed and took place, but also I'm talking about the institution that is dealing with the trials in absentia. Again, it might be, and this is not the case at the moment, but it might be they would be much better fit for that ICC as a permanent court that it has also the possibility to have like follow up procedure like a retrial, than a temporary tribunal like the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And I don't think that, I mean, I, I agree that to a certain extent, this judgment and the work of the tribunal was very good in um, find, again, like in getting uh, factual findings for the situation in Lebanon and for the Lebanese people from an historical and political point of view. However, I'm not that sure that they actually set like the best example possible a trial in absentia in international criminal law. And I'm not saying that is the worst one also though. So I'm, I'm in between. So that's why I don't really like when there are these extremist views on one, one side or the other. I really started coming from a civil law country. I really started with a very like, you know, position that was quite biased and in favor of trials in absentia as a very good and effective procedure. But then when I was interviewing practitioners and I saw it in practice in this year, I, I kind of slightly changed my mind and I start seeing also some of the limits of these type of procedures. So in that sense, I always keep uh, saying that trials in absentia shouldn't be used only when we have issues or when there is something that is not working. So we're trying to find an alternative way of solving issues. For instance, we mentioned the ICTY. The ICTY only had pre-trial in absentia proceedings or confirmation of charges in absentia under Rule 61, simply because, and so they didn't have trials in absentia as the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, so total trial in absentia, because they were very good on, on the ground to find people that were hiding and they were absconding. So there was really a very nice connection with national authorities and the possibility to cooperate and get these people that they were accused um, arrested and so like transferred to, to the Hague. So the problem is also that trials in absentia shouldn't be used as, a, as a, an isolated tool, as an isolated procedure from the context in which they have to be uh, conducted. And that means also, what is the level of cooperation that we can get from the ground, from national authorities? If we know that in Lebanon, there is a part of the territory that is not even accessible to the governmental authorities, and therefore the arrest warrants would not be, even if they're issued, they would not be then uh, implemented. 
are we sure that then we can really justify trans and abstention saying that these people are absconding or that they are aware of the proceeding? We can make this assumption, but we also have to recognize the limits of this assumption based on the political and social context that we are considering. And this applies to many situations, just the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. If you think about other situations and cases that are tried, for instance, at the ICC, it might be very difficult to have cooperation from the ground, from national authorities, and therefore to pursue these arrests. So is tries in absentia the only and ultimate answer to this problem? Or can we have alternatives? They are not a tries in absentia. And again, middle ground here, I would say it's, it's be best to just trying to see how it works in practice, although we might be very enthusiastic about it from a theoretical point of view, then there are also people involved like practitioners. They might have different opinions, although they're not necessarily against it, opposing it, per se, but they might see the limitations into their practice. Thanks a lot, Ilaria. Thijs, any comments that you would like to give before we go to the general q and I'll be brief because uh, I've, I've actually learned uh, a lot. Uh, thanks, Ilaria and, uh, and Olga. Um, and I think you've added uh, most, most, most of the ingredients to, to, to a very good discussions. Just, just a couple of points, I think, when we talk about footnotes, um, speaking as an historian, but, but also perhaps speaking for lawyers, nothing is more important than having good footnotes. Um, so, so in that sense, I think we should perceive a judgment as well. I mean, it's, it's a tiny bit of history, but it's, it's not unimportant. Um, the only thing I'm saying is that for some people, they may conceive it as, as a footnote in terms of a larger history of, of events that are joyful and, and also um, unjoyful. Um, so, so that's that's a remark about about footnotes, and I think this judgment really sets into uh, perhaps the historiography of the history of Lebanon. And I was actually quite shocked to hear that there is no real um, good history book on on the history of Lebanon. So, so perhaps this is indeed a start, or at least something that fills in the gap. And I've seen the same in actually in Sierra Leone, where actually the tribunal. Perhaps it did not write so much history, but the history it did write actually perhaps became authoritative and, and gave rise to, to more historical um, inquisition and, and study. So I think it can also serve as um, a springboard. Um, in terms of trials and absentia, I find the topic just, just amazing and very interesting. And um, last weekend I was reading um, some sources about the People's Revolutionary Tribunal in the Democratic Kampuchea. So this was a trial in 1979, which dealt with Pol Pot in Ying Sari. And this was, of course, the first in absentia trial which dealt with questions of genocide. And, and also it had some international dimensions. And while thinking about it, perhaps trials in absentia serve different purposes than convictions, as, as you rightfully say, Ilaria, because it's more about closing a period that was very violent and perhaps also giving it a name, right? So in Cambodia, it was about labeling the events between 1975 and 1979 genocide. And that's basically what took place. What happens here is that basically the attack on Hariri and, and, and others now has a name as well. We consider it a terrorist crime and, and judges have also found it to be so. So actually we find purpose in, in sort of labeling an historical um, event as well. Whether the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia have ever learned from the trials in absentia in 1979, it's another question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and of course, Pol Pot and Ying Sari were both not tried. So, so other people uh, were tried um, in that sense. Um, I think that's, uh, that's about it. And, um, and actually, oh, one last thing. <laughs> When, it's, when, it's, when it gets to context, um, Olga, I, I really want to congratulate you for, for doing an excellent job. I mean, the judges are there to, to render a judgment on a very specific event, which happened on one day. And I think you do, do an amazing job of contextualizing this event and, and talking about um, larger political issues in, in the context during which it took place. And I, th I think it really helps us understanding um, more the history of it and, and also the complexity. So thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Couldn't agree more. That's why we, of course, also invited Olga and, and the two of you. So th thank you so much for your interesting insights.
Uh, we, are, we now have some time for a Q&A with you and the audience, the people watching at home, and some questions and compliments are also coming in, which we both appreciate a lot, of course. Um, so there's one question um, from uh, Marina Meyer, um, who asks, uh, what kind of outreach program does the SDL have? And this is, of course, also a little bit related, I think, to the topic of managing expectations that we mentioned, and it's not only limited to the SDL, you also see these problems with the ICC. Um, so, uh, Olga, can you explain a bit more what the STL has done really to reach out to the, to the public uh, in Lebanon? Okay, so we have a, in the outreach program in Lebanon, we are three, right? So we have quite limited resources, although I will say that the STL did something that no other tribunal had done prior to that, which is it put outreach in the rules of procedure and evidence, which is very important. So you have rule 52, which mandates the registrar with establishing an outreach program to disseminate uh, information. The way that uh, done it, uh, within the organization is that our colleagues in the Hague deal with the media. So what we do is we focus on the legal professionals, on the academic community, on the NGO community, and so forth within Lebanon. And we have done many different programs. The biggest program that we have implemented over these years since 2011, and of which ASTRA is also part since the beginning, is the Indra University Program on International Criminal Law and Procedure, because international criminal law was simply not taught at Lebanese universities, except as a very small part of public international law in some cases. And there was not much interest in establishing a master's program because it was seen as, as just a niche um, area. So what we did was we collaborated with 11 different universities and have been collaborating with 11 different universities in Lebanon, offering this course online. So the lecturers attend from Astor Institute in The Hague and they speak directly via video link to students in Lebanon. And what has been remarkable, so the, the program includes interpretation into Arabic for those who may not have a, a, an excellent command of, of the English language to make it as inclusive as possible. It also includes uh, two visits to The Hague for uh, professors involved in implementing the program and one for students who higher, uh, had the highest score in their final exam. So initially the program was intended to, we were, when, when we were organizing it and discussing it with Astor at the time, we, were, we would have been happy to have 30 to 40 people attend each session of the program. And I'm happy to say that in, in, since 2011, uh, nearly 1,200 people have actually graduated from the program. It's been absolutely remarkable how many young people were interested in receiving this information, would actually attend these classes in the evenings in addition to their own studies. And basically, I mean, other than the certificate, and the potential study trip to The Hague, there was no other incentive except for the learning itself. So it was really remarkable to see how many young people um, became interested in this. Some of them have gone on to teach uh, in the cr international criminal law, which was the idea is to empower some people to actually go into the field. Others have gone on to be interns at the uh, STL and other uh, international criminal courts and possibly pursue a career in that field. So it's been um, quite quite a remarkable uh, program all around. In fact, uh, another uh, initially unanticipated consequence of this program has also been the fact that since the students attend from each other's universities, right? It's a, they attend from amphitheaters on a rotational basis they repeatedly report back that this is one uh, element of the, of the whole course which had, they enjoyed the most. The ability to actually, again, context is important. Lebanon was a very divided country, is a very divided country, maybe a little bit less so since the, the most recent revolution, but it's still very divided. So you, when you have students from one state run and, and, and 10 private universities, they will not have had a chance to visit each other's universities on a regular basis. So this interaction led one of the professors actually to call it the best attempt at reconciliation since the civil war, which is 
very much an unanticipated and very welcome um, consequence of the program. In addition to that, we have done a number of trainings for lawyers. Lawyers are very interested in, in trainings, uh, in sorry, in uh, criminal proceedings at the international level. So we have facilitated trainings by, tra by experienced judges and prosecutors um, uh, from abroad who have trained Lebanese lawyers on international criminal proceedings. We have organized the public, the translation of the uh, Antonio Cassese book on international criminal law, which is the first textbook that was actually translated and available in Arabic on the topic. We have also published the glossary of legal terms in English, French, and Arabic to assist those who follow the proceedings, uh, published a number of other uh, publications with information about the tribunal hosted many, many briefings on the work of the tribunal um, and so on. And, based in, and as I mentioned, interacted very much with uh, legal professionals and academics and students and NGO, NGO community. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. And of course, I fully agree uh, with respect to the Lebanon Lecture Series, which really is, I must say, one of our uh, flagship uh, projects. Um, another point that you made, Olga, is that there is no authoritative book history on Lebanon. And uh, one of the viewers, Tatiana Krizi, and again, my apologies if I misspell, or sorry, if I mispronounce your name. Um, she has a question for Thais, and she says, uh, do you believe that creating a book for school education about universal history and agreed upon by all nations, which will, of course, be a challenge, I would say, uh, would be beneficial and have a deterring effect on future violations of international law? So... Tess, what do you think? Thank you for, for an excellent question, but also perhaps the, the most complex question. Um, nothing is as controversial as history and nothing is as contested as history. Um, between nations, among nations, between groups, among groups, even within families. So in order to write a history that people would agree to, um, I, I think that's a huge challenge. Um, then the question is, is whether if such a history could exist and um, who is going to write it? Um, are people going to believe it um, or will there be disagreement? Just thinking about the history of, of, of the Netherlands, the country where, um, well, we're now on Zoom, but <laughs> where the Asser, Studio, Asser Institute, of course, is based. We have huge debates about what our history constitutes and what are the important factors. Um, is the 17th century a golden age or is it an age of genocide, colonialism and exploitation? I mean, these are, these are questions after 400 years, we have not come to an agreement upon. So, so reaching an agreement is gonna be incredibly difficult. I think moreover, it will be difficult to do such a thing in a situation where there has been mass violence. Just looking at the former Yugoslavia, there exists so many truths and so many different versions of history. Um, and these are, oftentimes in competition with each other. Um, and of course there are parts on which people would agree. Um, so, so history is also very nuanced. Um, so it's very difficult to, to sort of come to um, just facts that people would agree on. And, and perhaps just facts and agreeing upon them would be very boring, right? So something happens in 1917. Okay, but what is the meaning? How do we interpret it? And, and, and what do we do with it? That's another question. Then the question whether this would actually lead to preventing mass atrocities or, or international crimes, I'm not sure. Usually history is um, pretty much a springboard towards violence because it's so much contested. Um, because there are events from the past that give rise to uh, polarization and politicization of ethnicity and give leads to, to, to violence as well. So, so I find it a very difficult question. Also, when we think about the United Nations, of course, it was set up for the purpose to prevent and punish genocide. So the Adachidim was never again. And what we've seen afterwards is that it happens over and over and over again. So, so I think there will be no real um, role for a shared history in, in, in sort of solving the problem of, um, of mass violence. Sorry, sorry to be pessimistic, but I'm, but I'm hopeful. So, so I think in some situations, um, of course, perhaps a debate about what happened in the past and, and looking for s solutions which are more political. So outside of the, the, the criminal justice realm, I would say, 
um, perhaps um, could be um, of some help. Um, yeah, it's a very nuanced answer, so, so no definite answer. We, we love nuanced answers, and that's also how, what reality is like, of course. Um, maybe a question for uh, Olga, one of the viewers asked a question. So what distinguished the finding of Ayash being guilty um, and the other three accused being acquitted? So what evidence really tipped the scale? Well, I can't actually answer that question because I, I'm not in the in the minds of the judges as to which particular evidence. But I think it's um, again, as as was pointed out by by Eladia, if they do not receive evidence that convinces them beyond a reasonable doubt, they're obliged to quit. So they felt that they did not receive evidence that convinces them beyond a reasonable doubt of the involvement of the remaining um, three individuals. That's all I can really say because I honestly couldn't possibly tell you, you know, here's this one piece of evidence. It's just not something that I would know. Sure. Maybe another question uh, to you. Um, so one of the viewers again asked the question, what problems or obstacles do you anticipate will arise with respect to demands by victims for reparations on the national level? So could the reparations program be established? And if so, through what state organs or mechanisms? Any views on this? That's a complex question. And again, one that I can't answer just because it will be up to the Lebanese uh, government to set something up. Unfortunately, don't forget that now we're dealing, I mean, they are dealing with the aftermath of the blast. And as far as I can tell, not particularly well. Um, so it's, there's a lot, and there's a lot going on in Lebanon at the moment. And again, uh, this, it's, you know, the, the country is in complete, economic freefall. Um, there's, it's, it's, there's hyperinflation. There's so much going on right now that uh, it's very, very difficult to predict uh, or even speculate on what will happen under the current circumstances um, with, with the whole issue because um, there are many, as I mentioned right now, I think that there are many other priorities. Um, so we'll see, but it's hard to speculate. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. Um, let's go maybe to a question to, to Ilaria. So do you think that in absentia trials will follow more often by other tribunals now that despite non-cooperation um, uh, from the side of, of the state, at least an authoritative judicial record has been established? Do you think that other tribunals, other hybrid, hybrid tribunals that may still be established may follow that in absentia example that the STL has set? Yeah, that's a $1 million question, I would say, in the sense that, who knows? I mean, according to the critics, um, no. So there is not real like future and space for an advertising absentia at international level. I would like, obviously, from, like, from my point of view as a researcher and academic to see it actually um, in practice more because it will be, again, like, just like the development of the rules and the practice. So it would really help to see how we can fill the gaps that we might have uh, experienced with STL and how can we address some of the questions that are left unanswered. The problem is, is that, is then what is the purpose of the tries in absentia? It's just an academic exercise that we are involved in or do we want to provide justice to the victims? Because if, if the second is our main goal and purpose, and I think should be the main goal, purpose and goal of international agreement proceedings, then we might find difficult to justify again another exercise like tries in absentia as, as special tribunal for Lebanon that might be very lengthy, very expensive. And at the same time, it might not provide the, the answers to questions that are still there. Because um, when I was, for instance, looking, uh, I was watching like the other day, one of the videos, I think was probably um, created by the outreach uh, uh, organ of, of the tribunal explaining um, the really result obtained with the, the judgment. And there were different points that were made. One of these was that there was an achievement of justice for victims. But then the question is, what type of justice again? So are we talking about the possibility to get reparations at national level based on the conviction of Mr. Ayash? Or are we talking about recognition of the victims as victims? So their situation as being the victim of a wrongdoing. Uh, are we talking about, as Thais was saying, the historical truth? 
or the historical record of what happened in terms of facts for the Lebanese history and, and, and politics. I don't know. So again, if we just look at what the SDL has done, we might well say, no, this is just an academic exercise. So we, we can't replicate this. But if we instead think about Trizin absentia as potentially be improved in the future, then obviously the special tribunal for Lebanon is just the first example. We can't take it as the best example again, as I said before. It has definitely set the ground for future in absentia proceedings. The problem is, is the international community ready to pay for it and ready to go for another trials in absentia that might be not that popular um, in the eyes of the people that will be affected by this tribunal that might be set up or by a new proceeding that will start. Who knows, again, like a $1 million question. I have no answer for this. Um, so yeah, personally, I would be very interested to see it, but again, this is very selfish for me to say that because again, I'm not involved in this type of proceedings directly. I'm not the victim, I'm not the legal practitioner. So we really have to also ask the people that are involved what they think about these trials and if they are satisfied by it or not. Thank you very much. Um, in view of the time, maybe the last question from uh, Rebecca Eger that I actually will also mention at the uh, conclusion of this lecture. She asked if by any chance the August 4th explosion was deemed an attack and potentially linked to the close announcement of the STL final verdict. Could the STL acquire jurisdiction over this explosion as a connected case? Um, Olga, would you like to take this question too? Uh, sure. Well, the way that uh, the STL jurist, again, obviously, this is a, a very much a hypothetical, right? The jurisdiction of the tribunal is, is clear. It's in Article 1 of the statute. And it says that in addition to the Hariri attack, if the tribunal finds other attacks that occurred in Lebanon between 1 October 12, 2004 and 12 December 2005, or any later date decided by the parties and with the consent of the Security Council are connected and so on and so forth. So anything for the date beyond 12 December 2005, anything at all would have to be connected, but also the jurisdiction would have to be agreed upon by Lebanon, the UN, and the Security Council. So um, that's the short answer to that um, question. That's what the jurisdictional requirement is. And so far, we have not had any jurisdiction. The STL has not had jurisdiction for anything beyond the 12th of December 2005. Um, as I mentioned in, in, in um, the beginning, there was an investigator who was involved in the in the investigating the case, the case in early days who himself was assassinated. And of course, the speculation is that that assassination was somehow directly result, uh, linked. Of course, again, speculation. Um, but uh, it, the STL, as far as I'm aware, has neither sought nor and does not have uh, jurisdiction over that case, which was, uh, again, again, after 12 December 2005. Thank you. Any final observations from the panelists before I conclude? I look at Thais, I look at Ilaria. Maybe I'll just say one more sentence. Oh, okay. <laughs> the justice <laughs> for victims. Um, so it's, it's imp in my experience at the ICTY, which uh, was extensive in terms of, of the number of cases um, that the ICTY dealt with, you found the most uh, diverse reactions of victims in terms of what they actually expected from these judgments. Some people wanted compensation. Other people said there is no compensation that could possibly replace the losses and therefore any compensation would be insulting, right? So there's two opposite views on, on, on compensation right there. Others said, I simply don't need to explain to anyone anymore that what happened to me was genocide, for example. And that to them meant everything that they wanted out of the case. All that to say, I think that a reaction is, is an extremely individual and personal one. 
Um, I've heard reactions to the ICC decision on reparations in one of the cases, I forget the case now, um, uh, from a couple of years ago, which caused a lot of controversial reactions, which I'm sure you would be aware of, where people felt insulted by the amounts and others said, yes, but there is symbolism involved and so on and so forth. So the reactions are really, really different. But in my experience, compensation is not always the most important thing. And uh, there's many, many other things that come out of these judgments that uh, mean, that make them meaningful to victims. Thank you. Ilaria, Thais, any? Maybe any just, idea? maybe just one, one point. Uh, I think Olga actually makes, makes a really important point. Um, we always think about reparations in terms of money. Um, but of course, there, there are different things to think about. I mean, truth is a very important thing. Knowing what happens to your loved ones and how they deceased, where they are, I think is a very important question as well. And, and perhaps this is what um, in absentia trials actually can cater for. And I'm just thinking about um, the trial we have in the Netherlands, which relates to MH17, which is in perhaps a little bit of a universal jurisdiction type of trial. but. It really de depends on the question that lives amongst society and what they desire from a trial. And I think the Dutch public at this point is very prone to sort of find out what had happened in the first place. And, and perhaps punitive justice may come at a later stage um, when, when, when suspects are arrested or not. I mean, um, it, it perhaps has to do as well with, uh, with sequencing. Yeah, uh, if, if, I may, if I may, um, yes, absolutely. I agree with both points. And in terms of reparation, I think that we should also draw a distinction um, on whether the tribunal, for instance, as the special tribunal for Lebanon, then can give the possibility for victims to go to national courts because reparations they can get there are very different from the ones that, for instance, they can get from the ICC. And again, there is a huge discussion ongoing about for instance, collective reparations against individual reparations and the amount of victims also that can participate in a proceeding. Because in this case, there was a limited number of victims that were asking to participate as civil parties. In other cases, it might be that the victims are so many that that's not really possible as an option to get, give them individual reparations. So reparations also, it's quite um, a difficult and complex um, concept, not just for the fact that it's just one of the options and one of the outcomes for victims, but also because even within this concept, under the umbrella of reparations, there are so many different variations that we need to take into account. I totally agree that trials in absentia might actually um, um, be used for different purposes and for different outcomes for the victims. Um, but again, we need to make sure that we um, agree on this with the victims involved as well. And we don't simply rely upon our interpretation then we impose this uh, top to bottom to the victim saying, I think this is the best option for you because we think that although you can't get someone physically present in court, you will still get recognition as the victim. You could still, might still get compensation, et cetera. We really need to um, listen to the victim side in terms of asking them also if this is something that they will be happy with. And also we need to see what is then um, the image that we transmit to the international community of this proceeding and this type of trials. And again, going back to my very initial point, we can't compare this type of trials to a normal criminal proceedings. And if we do that, if the image that we reflect to the outside world is that one is incorrect, and it might actually be detrimental for future trials in absentia because it will give the wrong message about them, about the purpose, about the expectations that are met or not met. And so it would create, create even com more confusion and perhaps even anger against this type of trials. So I don't think that then there will be a future indeed anymore. Yeah, thanks a lot for these final observations. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your questions and the answers. I think this has been an extremely uh, interesting event. I would like to thank all the panelists for their insights, uh, as well as the events and communications team of the Osser Institute for their excellent work in the background, as well as you, of course, the audience, for joining and for your questions. 
Also, if you want to re-watch certain parts, this webinar has been recorded uh, and will be placed on the ASA website and its YouTube channel. And in fact, I would like to take this opportunity to let you know that the ASA Institute has established a new website, the ASA Nexus on Conflict and Crime. And on this website, we will collect and present all the Institute's knowledge products from publications to lectures, from trainings to databases in the field of international humanitarian law, international criminal law, transnational criminal law, and legal aspects of countering terrorism. We see that these four subfields are increasingly overlapping and interacting. And I think today's lecture has shown that as well and leading to new fundamental questions as well as practical challenges. So in view of their interconnectedness, it's not only interesting, but in fact sensible to analyze these fields, not in isolation, but in concert. And the ASA Nexus on Conflict and Crime aims to assist in that effort. We just launched a website, which can be accessed via www.asa.nl slash nexus, very original, uh, but we will continue to develop and improve it on a continuing basis. So we very much look forward to your feedback. Um, and the viewers of this lecture will be pleased to hear that on this new website, you will also find a reference to an analysis of the summary of the judgment in the Ayash case, which has been prepared by Rebecca Ego, a legal expert at Expertise France, um, who I would like to thank here as well. So finally, I would like to inform you that next week on the 10th of December, we will organize another SCL together with IMPACT, which is the Center Against Human Trafficking, and Sexual Violence and Conflict on Sexual Terrorism. And you can still register via the ASA website. So thanks again to all of you and hopefully see you next week. Thanks very much.